Hello, my name is Yvonne Jagadar. I'm the Artistic Director of Third Eye Fest. And on behalf of Third Eye, I'd like to welcome you to our 2022 series of monthly events on healing in the days of COVID. Uh, today, we'll be joined by Dr. Rupa Maria and discuss her book that she co-authored with Raj Patel, Inflamed, Deep Medicine and the Anatomy of Injustice. The book illuminates the hidden relationship between our biological systems and the profound injustices of our political economic systems. First, an animated introduction of the book by Aaron Kirbel. You wake up one morning with a dry, hacking cough, and you've lost your sense of smell. You visit your doctor for a diagnosis. With an x-ray and nasal swab, she diagnoses COVID. The coronavirus infected your body and your lungs and nerves are now inflamed. The inflammation sends you to hospital and when you're in the ICU, you look around and notice a disproportionate number of people of color. In the United States, hospitalization and death rates for people of color are far higher than for white people. You make another kind of diagnosis yourself. This, you observe, is the outcome of structural racism. But how did those structures come to be? To understand that, we must go back 600 years to a time when a different pestilence spread across the globe. One that continues today and which still makes us sick. And it makes us sick in a patterned way, through inflammatory disease, which underlies all the leading causes of death in industrialized places. European colonization transformed the planet. Through slavery, genocide and disease, colonists brought with them a cosmology that changed how people relate to each other and to the living world around them. Those who resisted were set to the flame. This history lives inside you, whether you know it or not. Since you were conceived, your body has been exposed to the consequences of a world on fire. The COVID hospital ward and the specific patients who are in its beds look that way because of centuries of attempts to extinguish other kinds of knowledge and civilizations. If we understand disease with this new kind of diagnosis, the treatment options become radically different. The deep medicine we prescribe to address the inflammation of people and planet has been prescribed by others before us. Rudolf von Virchow and Sitting Bull and Franz Fanon. Huda Sha'arwi and B.R. Ambedkar and Harriet Tubman. They understood that our modern ills can't simply be vaccinated away. We need a world rebuilt with care at its heart. But what does that look like? Many indigenous communities have resisted colonialism by continuing to care for the living world around them. Their care for life protects them inside and out. Indigenous communities defend the greatest range of biodiversity on the planet and, as a result, host the most diverse microbiota inside their bodies. These microbes confer protection against inflammatory disease. When culture isn't capitalist and isn't colonized, it can soothe the inflammatory diseases that afflict us and fuel the burning of our planet. Deep medicine offers new and old stories that connect humans to the teeming microbes in our guts and to the teeming stars in the skies. We offer a glimpse into cosmologies that bring a cooling balm to a world, to societies, and to bodies that are inflamed. inflamed. And we're thrilled to welcome Dr. Rupa Maria, one of the authors of the book, Inflamed. Dr. Rupa Maria is an Associate Professor of Medicine at University of California, San Francisco, where she practices and teaches internal medicine. She's co-founder of the Do No Harm Coalition, a collective of health workers committed to addressing disease through structural change. Rupa, welcome and thank you for this epic book. Um, I just wanted to start right in. Can you talk about the connection between capitalism and the COVID pandemic? How does capitalism prime us and our planet for sickness? Oh, in all the ways, and the way Raj Patel and I describe it in our book, um, Inflamed, we, we actually call it colonial capitalism because it's not just any garden variety capitalism. It's the capitalism that came from a specific time and place advanced through ideologies that separated people from the web of life and from our duties to one another and to all the living things that keep us healthy and well. Um, and so through that colonial capitalism, architectures of oppression were set up in places like here, what's now called the United States or so-called Canada or Australia, New Zealand, the other places around the world, or even India, which, you know, although we call it, you know, post-colonial, 
all the same structures are still in place and they're still being exploited um, in the same ways that they were under colonialism, except the, the money is moving different ways. And so um, that oppression um, and the fracturing of critical relationships that keep us healthy um, predisposes us to poor outcomes. And COVID really shows that. And the book looks at how the immune system is responding to the, um, the architecture of society created through colonial capitalism in a very pattern specific way um, that leads to chronic inflammatory disease. And so that, that was an interesting um, understanding for me as a doctor, because I've been intuiting these things for a while. And as an activist and a musician traveling with my band around the world to see how health and society intersect, um, and then to come back to the bedside at the hospital and to see how it's playing out in the bodies of people working in the farms in the Central Valley, um, you know, undocumented migrant workers, um, different groups of people get sick in different kinds of ways. And that has always interested me. Um, and what we see with the pandemic now is, you know, the United States um, is, you know, on the top of the list in terms of mortality. Um, just there's been so much lack of care for the elderly, the children, um, the workers, um, that you see the, the outcome in, in, you know, how not just in how capitalism preconditions our bodies for a worse health outcome, but then that the healthcare system structured through capitalism means that we have nurses and trash bags and, you know, executives determining our healthcare response um, rather than patients and providers. And so it's been very, very challenging. Could you speak to the current challenges and or opportunities Black, Indigenous, and people of color communities are experiencing with COVID, including but not limited to systemic structural racism and health disparities? Yeah, so what we see with COVID, as we see with influenza, as we see with chronic inflammatory disease, that, you know, the, that our bodies are being preconditioned by our social conditions, our social ecological conditions. So the more disconnected we are from a rich biodiverse environment, the more disconnected we are from our own power or autonomy, um, our own ability to speak our languages or continue with our cultural understandings of who we are, and the more we're forced into the um, arrangement set up through a colonial capitalist society, the harder it is for our bodies to be healthy. Um, and then something like COVID comes along in bodies that are already chronically ill from inflammatory disease, and it just is like a match to a tinderbox. Um, and that's what we've seen. So who is dying from COVID still with this Omicron surge, just Black and Indigenous Latino? Um, it's people who suffer the brunt of um, chronic social oppression. And so um, that experience is, um, you know, critical to understand because for me as a doctor, I see that we're not going to make any change in these health outcomes until we, until we start restructuring the world around people's bodies. Um, we can focus on the bodies and try to keep as many people healthy as we can. But if we want to stop, like stem the tide of these chronic inflammatory diseases and how they set us up for poor outcomes when something like COVID comes along, then we have to start really restructuring the world around us. And that's what we refer to as deep medicine. Mm. Yes, you, you, you mentioned the differences between uh, Western medicine, holistic medicine, indigenous medicine, and deep medicine. Um, could you elaborate a little on those comparisons? Well, Western medicine was part of the colonial capitalist project. So when we these lands were colonized, our homelands were colonized, um, missionaries, medics, and militaries went together. And so doctors originally at that time were coming from an enlightenment um, understanding of science, of self versus other, um, of the way the body was even arranged anatomically, that the brain was some sort of better thing or hierarchical structure of the body as opposed to an integrated body system or even body mind system or body mind spirit, God forbid that you even bring that into the language of Western medicine, right? And so this very reductionist, very hierarchical, um, colonial way of seeing the body and the patient and people um, is how Western medicine still operates. Um, and so we shouldn't be surprised when we see that, you know, mothers who are Black in New York 
are 12 times more likely to die after giving birth than white mothers. Um, even though it's shocking when you see that statistic, you realize that this is actually baked into the architecture of Western medicine, that black people's pain is not um, understood or empathized with um, in Western medicine because, because of those histories, because of those lines of power that have been drawn in very specific ways throughout every institution in our society and medicine is a part of that. So, so that's Western medicine. So if people are, you know, annoyed at their doctor for not listening to them or interrupting them in the first 12 seconds of encounter, that's part of the, um, you know, the, the axes of domination. The doctor is the expert, even in your own body, the doctor is the expert that could, you know, patients and communities um, don't really know what's going on. They go to the doctor for the information. Um, the doctor diagnoses it. But Western medicine purposefully obscures and hides lines of power and limits the investigation to this individual, what we call the liberal individual. Um, so it's like you're sick because you made bad choices and you just need to diet and exercise more and you'll be fine. And holistic medicine takes that a little bit further and says, well, no, there's a body and a mind and a spirit. And maybe just go sit and meditate somewhere in a corner and you'll do better. Um, but you can't like meditate your way out of a planet on on fire. Um, and the planet is on fire for the same reason that our bodies are on fire, um, that there's a gross misunderstanding of humans and our place in relationship to the whole living system of the earth. Um, and that we need to reintegrate those proper relationships in order to have different outcomes, um, not just new technologies, um, but, but finding a mindset that can actually um, lead to proper outcomes action. And so that's why we, we came up with this concept of deep medicine that we really pulled from deep ecology and integrating with, um, you know, indigenous systems of, of well-being. Um, so if you look at the places on earth that are stewarded with the most biodiversity, those are places that are being stewarded by indigenous people with culturally intact um, ways of knowing. Um, if you look in, in that far superior to any like private or public conservation efforts, um, and what is it about their systems of knowing that is superior in terms of enhancing biodiversity? Well, the same thing goes for what when you look at the gut microbiota. So if you look at the most biodiverse gut microbes in the world, they belong to people who are living with these same like cosmologies that are still intact, same ways of knowing in the world who they are and their relationship to everything around them. And so it's not a cosmology of domination. It's not a cosmology of taking and extracting what you want or um, it's a cosmology of, in general, it's reciprocity. There are certain concepts and ideas that seem to be present in all of these communities. And so um, deep medicine, like deep ecology, doesn't center the human as like the end all be all of what health is. Um, it's not individual centric, it's not human centric, um, but it's understanding for humans to be healthy. Our bodies need to be in, in, in a world that is healthy. And that health is a, an emergent phenomenon that comes out of systems interacting well together. Um, and that, and that is, and it's something that you can't actually get as an individual. And this is where the holistic medicine thing goes wrong um, because it's, it's really focused on the liberal individual. I see. Um, uh, what has been the response to your book uh, from the medical community, let's say? It's been um, amazing. I was surprised to see The Lancet uh, publish an, an incredible review by Dr. Aletha Maybank um, and um, looking at the colonial roots of Western medicine um, that we're talking about racial capitalism, that we're talking about these things in medicine right now is, is wonderful. Um, so there are medical schools that have put my book into like first year reading classes. Um, wow. There are medical schools that are inviting me to give grand rounds and bring these connections together. I get stopped in the hallway at work by people who are experts in inflammatory disease, like in the ICU, um, who will say, oh my God, this blew my mind because they're looking at it like this. And so for Raj and I, we really wanted to connect the microscopic to the macroscopic and back and forth so that we understand that we can't simply dominate with one narrative and expect to tell the whole um, story. And even what we did in our book, we, we aren't able to encompass the whole story. Um, but we are trying to give a language that's, that weaves together enough systems of knowing that gives us a, a, actually something with better explanatory power. So why is there a, you know, a pandemic of diabetes? Why is everyone getting diabetes? Why is everyone getting uh, chronic kidney disease? Why do we now have 
um, inflammatory liver conditions, non-alcoholic fatty liver disease, surpassing alcoholic cirrhosis is the leading cause of liver failure um, you know, in modern industrialized countries. So what's going on? Um, so these kinds of questions don't, um, can't get answered when your diagnosis is focusing on, you know, individual um, pathologies and not seeing the systemic pathologies that are driving these conditions. You know, um, reading your book, I, 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 it reminded me of, uh, um, it reminded me, sorry, it reminded me of Ibrahim e X. Kendi's book, uh, How to Be an Anti-Racist. And he's done different versions of his book uh, for children as, as well as for young adults. So my, my question is, uh, do you think there's a value for a version of the book Inflamed for young adults too? Absolutely. I've been wanting to do a zine version of each chapter. Um, like I've been thinking about how to, because it's really dense, you know, and and we and we left it that way because we wanted to give our communities the language and understanding of what's happening in their bodies as a result of the things that they intuit. Like people know, like I'm getting sick because of this air pollution. Um, we wanted to help um, trace those things for people so that when they're ready, um, you know, depending on what their education has been, that they could find a way to fluency around some of these ideas, but it's hard and it's dense. And we went back and forth with the editor several times like is this too much science is this too much this is this too much and they're like no we got to leave it in we got to leave it in so that people can can see the 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 the, the literal jumps that have been made the connections that we have drawn um but i have thought like you know it's much easier when i give it as a lecture with like drawings or I'm, I'm setting up a lecture now where I'm going to be incorporating music and some animation um, because even for physicians um, we're so used to practicing in this like way that we can't sometimes access the knowledge because our frontal lobes are so engaged right and so what if you can access the knowledge through sound or through art in a way that your brain won't let you through your frontal lobe um, it's like experiencing what deep medicine is and experiencing a sense of whole through other ways of knowing. Um, and so to allow us to admit those into our sciences. And so Raj and I don't want to throw away Western science. We want to like recognize the violence uh, upon which it is built towards indigenous people and animals. Like we don't need to continue to be violent to know things. So how do we help that science evolve into something that not only gives us knowledge, but also affords us meaning and um, helps to, you know, understand how to be better people, humans living on planet Earth in a way right. that can support the whole system? Yeah, I, I must admit, throughout the book, I was looking at trying to figure out the structure, you know, and initially I was thinking very linear, rational, you know, thesis, because, 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 and then I was thinking more like the web of life, you know, like it's integrated in a totally different manner. And I really appreciate that. Um, the, there's sections in the book that uh, deal with diversity of voices and the history of music as resistance and healing. Could you speak to those issues and also about your band, The April Fishes, and when your next concert is? Yeah, it's like, um, that was my favorite part of the book to write. <laughs> like, the book was very hard to write. There was a lot of research. There was a lot of sitting and really wrestling with the issues. And Raj and I spoke every morning at 5 a.m. For a, for a year um, to, you know, debate the issues and, and you know, do exactly what you just said, weaving the threads so that as we were writing it, we like bring up a thread and put it back down and then take it a little further and bring it up and take it a little further. And um, so it was this very intricate weaving that happened with the book. Um, but music for me is always like my favorite way of knowing and my own you know, best medicine. Um, and it's been really hard the last two and a half years because all of our concerts have been well all of our big concerts were canceled and then I refused to do the smaller concerts because I still don't feel like it's right to be gathering people indoors um and playing while they drink <laughs> because because of COVID so like for me as a mom of a three-year-old and as someone concerned about our immunocompromised communities 
It's been very challenging, um, but we will be playing May 7th um, at the Quarry Amphitheater in Santa Cruz, a free show. Um, I'll be doing a lecture that morning. That's the one I was just referring to for the UC Global Health Group. Um, it's a UC wide event around global health. Um, and uh, music is such a powerful way of knowing um, because it, it is inherently pluralistic. Like many people can do it at once. And actually when many people do do it at once, you get patterns that emerge as a phenomenon that is not actually any one person playing that. It's greater than the sum of its parts, which is the web of life. And so music is such a powerful, um, sorry, such a powerful um, example of what that kind of intelligence can do. Um, and so I love it. I just love it. I remember once when I was a resident, I, I was um, in the hospital in the emergency room and the, and the professor, like I was, a re I was in training and she's like, okay, this person came in without a pulse. I want you to run the code, you know, the code blue. And so I was there at the head of like head of the patient running the code. Okay, let's get this EKG. Let's make sure we get this. Let's put the, you know, get them on the ventilator. The pulse came back. Let's check this. Let's check that. And she, she looked at me afterwards. She was like, I've never seen someone run a code like that. Like you were totally calm. And I realized at that moment was like, oh, that's how I compose music because I'm always like, oh, we need a little more bass. Like when I'm mixing a song, I'm like, okay, now dial in the drums and bring up a little bit of this. And like, cause you can hear multiple things happening all at once and you're integrating it into an experience. Um, so that was funny to go, oh my God, I just ran a code. Like I ran my band. Um, yeah, so that that's a beautiful example of how when we cut music education out of schools, when we cut art education out of schools, we're missing the point that, you know, it's not about you study the thing in order to know it, it's that you, you broaden and enrich in the ways in which you know, and then your understanding becomes very nuanced and deep and, and, and much more, um, with much more explanatory power. Right. So wrapping it up, um, maybe one question, maybe two, if we have time. Uh, could you tell us about the deep medicine circle, uh, um, heal healers? Yes. Um, so at the tail end of writing the book, I, I got this sinking feeling that I couldn't continue to be a doctor in the same way after writing the book. Like these are things I've been working as an activist. I've been organizing with my communities, um, but I wanted to get step out of the hospital more and get more directly involved in the, in the healing work. Um, and so we formed this organization last year um, called the Deep Medicine Circle, which is a woman of color led organization committed to healing the wounds of colonialism through food, medicine, story, learning and unlearning and restoration. So what that looks like for us um, as a worker-directed nonprofit organization comprised of indigenous and non-indigenous people is working to give land back, farming under a new model where farming is, is understood as an act of healing by reasserting the, the sovereignty of our indigenous communities supporting them in their work to bring their culture and their cosmologies back to the land, their languages, farming under those perspectives, um, growing food and liberating it from the market system to give to urban hungry people um, who are being oppressed through the same structures that we are trying to address in our work. Um, and then, you know, telling the stories uh, about what we're doing, reasserting food as medicine, all these things. So there's a beautiful group of people working together and um, the Heal the Healers project, which is actually starting up tomorrow, is um, coming out of a group of nurses and doctors and other frontline workers who've come to the land when I've said, hey, come and work with me. And they're like, like starving for this land connection. And what um, some of them have said is, you know, can we do this more regularly? Because we need a way to connect to our healing purpose. And being a frontline provider in COVID under capitalism has been the most demoralizing thing I've ever seen. Like nurses are walking in the hallways, just like openly crying um, because they're not valued. Um, most, the most common word I've heard from healthcare workers is I feel betrayed. That's the most common phrase 
which is a horrible feeling to feel. Um, so we are coming together to compost our grief and to share our stories with each other, to sit with our indigenous elders. Um, Sage La Pena is a California native plant medicine woman. She's working with us with the Deep Medicine Circle. She and myself and this uh, Mapuche nurse, uh, Rosa um, Charlotte Sáenz, who's a teacher at CIAS, who's joining us. Um, we are gonna be holding it down with our Ramatush elder Kata Gomes and then just welcoming people to the land and doing some workshops and self-care and healing. Um, but this is exactly what, you know, if we can use our intelligence to bring land to heal us in our relationships with each other, in our relationships to our indigenous communities and in our relationships to the web of life, um, we'll come one step closer to where we need to be to address the planetary issues and, you know, what's going on in our local communities. That's great. I just have one last one question. Um, I, I guess is that related to your do no harm coalition the work that you're and and it and also um do you can you relate any of the experiences uh, uh, as to your work at standing rock also oh everything's all connected um so the do no harm coalition was started by myself and a group of med students and uh medical trainees uh after giving medical care to the frisco five who were on hunger strike in San Francisco protesting racist police violence. Um, and we organized around um, addressing the structural causes to poor health. So going upstream. And, and those uh, medical trainees and now doctors, they've graduated, become full doctors. They're some of the most inspiring people and nurses and physical therapists and herbalists. Um, some of the most inspiring inspiring people I've ever met um, in terms of the fierce commitment to have a political understanding of why our patients are getting sick and, and addressing it at that level. Um, so that organization started in 2016, um, around the same time I was called Standing Rock, Rock by California Indigenous Community to help out with the response because it was becoming increasingly violent. I went to serve um, and the Lakota Dakota grandmothers asked me to stay and help form a clinic to decolonize medicine. That work is now being led by these two incredible uh, um, Lakota and Dakota women, uh, Tasha Peltier and um, Elena Eagleshield. And so they are forming a whole health circle out there. Um, I, I consider what they're doing is basically nation building for Standing Rock um, along a decolonial perspective. Um, so looking at energy, looking at schooling, looking at uh, health, looking at housing, looking at water, looking at all these things that have impacted how healthy people can be there, bringing back ceremonies that haven't been practiced in a couple hundred years, um, bringing back birthing practices, bringing back death practices. So these things are all that work of, you know, reconnecting us to who we are. Um, and that is critical work for all the all of our communities to be doing right now because we've all been jumbled and whitewashed through you know colonial capitalism. All of us, even my Irish husband, whose you know ancestors came here after they formed the IRA. So like he's been banging on the colonizer for a couple hundred years as well. Like they were the first um, they were the first experiment of the British uh, before they went around the world, um, and they're you know still colonized. Um, and so that work is critical for all of us to do. And before Europe could colonize around the world, they had to colonize their women. And so how the commons have been taken away from people, um, how women's authority over medicines and herbs and midwifery and all these practices that European women used to be central to in, in terms of their place in society. Um, these are things that, um, you know, it's not that we want to go back to feudal times before capitalism, but that we want to go forward to better than capitalism. Thank you so much, Rupa. Uh, thank you so much, Rupa, for that interview. And thank you so much for Inflamed. And thank you also to Raj Patel. And we recommend this book to all our viewers. Thank you again. Awesome. Thank you.